Our scripture text this morning is found in Luke chapter 22, starting with verse 14. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He did the same with the cup after supper, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another which one of them it could be who would do this. <clears throat> Jesus, the host of the supper, met them with a traditional kiss of peace. And then the men reclined around the table, Jesus at the Lord's left and John at his right. <clears throat> Jesus revealed his love by what he said and by what he did. He told his friends that he had a great desire to share this last Passover with them before he suffered. Passover commemorated the exodus of Israel from Egypt centuries before, but he would accomplish an even greater exodus on the cross. He would purchase redemption from sin for a world of lost sinners, Luke 9, 31. Then he got up, he wrapped himself with a towel, and he washed the disciples' feet, John 13. And when the Passover meal was drawing to a close, Jesus instituted the ordinance that the church calls communion, or the Lord's Supper, or even the Eucharist, which from the Greek word meaning to give thanks. The Passover feast opened with a prayer of thanksgiving, followed by the drinking of the first of four cups of wine. Next, they ate the bitter herbs and sang Psalm 113 and 114. Then they drank the second cup of wine and began eating the lamb and the unleavened bread. After drinking the third cup of wine, they sang Psalms 115 through 118, 118 that we read portions of this morning. And then the fourth cup was passed among them. It is likely that between the third and the fourth cups of wine, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. Paul gave the order of the supper in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 to 26. First, Jesus broke a piece from the unleavened loaf. He gave thanks and then he shared it with his disciples, saying that it represented his body which was given for them. He then gave thanks for the cup and shared it, saying that it represented his blood. It was a simple observance that used the basic elements of a Jewish meal. Jesus sanctified the simple things of life and used them to convey profound, convey profound spiritual truths. Jesus stated one of the purposes for the supper in remembrance of me. It's a memorial feast to remind the believer that Jesus Christ gave his body and his blood for the redemption of the world. When we partake, we identify ourselves with his body and blood. A second purpose for the supper is the proclaiming of his death until he returns. The supper encourages us 
encourages us to look back with a love and adoration to what he did for us on the cross and to look forward with hope and anticipation to his coming again. Since we must be careful not to come to the Lord's table with known sin in our lives, the supper should also be an occasion for looking within, examining our hearts and confessing our sins. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 32. A third blessing from the supper is the reminder of the unity of the church. We are one loaf. 1 Corinthians 10, 17. It is the Lord's Supper. It is not the exclusive property of any Christian denomination. Whenever we share in the supper, we are identifying with Christians everywhere and are reminded of our obligation to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 3. Following the instituting of the supper, Jesus taught his disciples many of the basic truths they desperately needed to know in order to have effective ministries in a hostile world. He prayed for his disciples, John 17. Then they sang a hymn and departed from the upper room for the Garden of Gethsemane. The night before his crucifixion, Christ is trying to communicate his deep love for all of us, illustrating it through the imagery of a Jewish wedding. He is comparing himself to the bridegroom who has paid a great price for his bride. Today we will look at the aspects of the Jewish marriage traditions in order to see how understanding them can deepen our understanding of what it means for God to refer to us, the church, as the bride of Christ. In the Jewish culture, when it was time for a man and a woman to marry, both fathers would negotiate the bride price, acknowledging that the bride would be a loss to her family. The father of the groom would then pay the agreed price to the father of the bride. This agreement was sealed with a drink of wine. Then the prospective groom would make his proposal by taking the cup of wine that his father had brought, drinking from it, and then offering it to the woman, symbolically saying that he wanted to make a covenant with her and that he was willing to give his life for her. If the woman accepted the proposal, she would seal the engagement by drinking from the same glass. From that moment on, she would be referred to as one who had been bought with a price. Now with that in mind, let's reread the account of the Last Supper in Luke 22, verses 19 and 20. He took the bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. During the Last Supper, Christ took the cup of wine in his hands and told his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. I'm sure that his disciples recognized the imagery of the marriage proposal. The groom offering the cup to the one he hoped would become his future bride, symbolically saying that he wanted to make a covenant with her and that he would be willing to give his life for her. And as they accept the cup from Christ, the disciples are in effect sealing the engagement, signaling their acceptance of and their commitment to Christ. As the disciples understand this, they begin to understand the depth of Jesus' love, a love so deep that he made a covenant with them and was willing to give his life. That was the bride price, the price he had to pay for us. He gave his life, his body, his blood. 
Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Continue looking at this and understand how it impacts who you are, how you live. Think about the deep love that Christ had for you, the bride price that he paid for you so that you could one day be his bride and how we are to live as his betrothed. Christ gave them the cup with the imagery of the marriage proposal. Then after he had finished the supper, he says that he's going to do what any potential groom had to do in that day and age. He had to go and prepare a place for his bride. As John 14 tells us, let not your heart be troubled, Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In Jesus' time, families usually lived in clusters of buildings called insulas. These clusters of buildings were built around a central courtyard. Grandparents, cousins, uncles, and aunts all lived together in one insula. So as sons married, they added to the insula. After asking a woman to marry him, the son would return to his own village and build new rooms onto his father's home. The son waited for the day when his father would declare that the building was complete. He didn't decide himself. The father had to decide. Then he could finally marry his bride and bring her to their new home. That's the word picture that Jesus is representing in the verses that we read today. It's also the same word picture that Christ uses when he describes his second coming. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only, Matthew 24, 36. So as Christ, as the bridegroom, is preparing a place for us in the Father's insula, his home, a place where we, the church, as his bride, will one day live with him. While he's doing this, what are we supposed to do? Once again, we can learn from the Jewish custom of the day. <clears throat> While the groom was off preparing a place for the new couple, the bride prepared herself and her bridesmaids for the groom's return, not knowing when it would happen. During the time the bride was expected to remain true to her groom as she prepared herself to be the kind of wife who would honor her husband. She would be learning from her mother so that she would be the best bride that she could be. And she lived in anticipation of his return, longing for the blast from the shofar announcing his return the trumpet sound that informed everyone that her groom had finally come for her. And as the bride of Christ, we too are to live for the day of his return, although like the Jewish bride, we don't know when it will be. We are to live preparing ourselves for the day when he will return to take us to his father's house. And as the bride of Christ, it is our responsibility to live in such a way that when people observe our lives, they know that we belong to him. They know that our life commitment is to our bridegroom. We are to live our lives preparing ourselves for living forever in eternity with him. We are to live in anticipation of his return, longing for the blast from the trumpet announcing his return, the sound that informs us that he has finally come. For the Lord himself would descend from heavens with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, 
will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. First Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. Remember that you are the bride of Christ. You have been bought with a price, his blood. You have accepted his proposal, come to him. Now you are his. Live your life in such a way that people may know that you are his, preparing for his coming, anxiously waiting for the day when he will return to take us to the home that he has prepared for us.